Welcome to Still Unbelievable, a podcast by Reason Press, where we examine religious claims, especially those made by Christians, and we regularly respond to items that are featured on the podcast, Unbelievable. We embrace dialogue, but as sceptical former believers, we will also criticise unfounded claims and unsupported beliefs. and welcome to another episode of Still Unbelievable. This time we're answering the question, or asking the question even, would you worship a god if you found out that one existed? So, but before we get to that, we're recording this here, or I'm recording this here in the UK. Uh, my my co-host and my guest are not here in the UK. But here in the UK, it's the morning after the night before that dreadful defeat in the in the Euro 2020 Football Cup. <laughs> and lots of um, unworshipful comments about our football team. Maybe they would have been worshipful if the result had been different last night. Maybe we'll get on to that. Maybe that's a very loose hook into the subject matter for today. But before I get into that, there's something else I'd like to say. And I'd like to give a shout out to the people over at the Born Again Again podcast and their Facebook group, because quite a few people, they've got a very busy, very active Facebook group. If you're a listener to this podcast and you enjoy this podcast, and if you're a listener to my guest podcast and you enjoy that podcast, I recommend that you pop over and you also subscribe to Born Again Again. Join their Facebook group as well. It's a very supportive, very active Facebook group. And so I wholly recommend that you get on there. Lots of people of different backgrounds and um, all equally supportive of each other. Quite often people come up and they'll ask the question, which podcast should I listen to? And every now and then in the answers to that, the Still Unbelievable podcast will get mentioned. So I'd like to thank you to all of those people over there who listen to this podcast and recommend it. But at approximately twice the rate of ours gets named our guest tonight. And so in trying to grab onto his fame and hang on to his coattails, I thought what better <laughs> thing to do to bring him on and share in some of that glory, because I can't let him have it all to himself. Welcome again on to Still Unbelievable, David. Very great pleasure to have you on. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Matthew and Andrew. You guys are, are awesome. Uh, you know, I I think back to the first time we got in contact, uh, you, reached, you guys reached out to me and I was like, man, I really want to meet these guys because I was such a fan of your show. <laughs> so... Uh, oh, yes, all, 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 you know, I'm constantly uh, quoting you guys and referring to your, your podcast. So thank you so much for having me on. So thank you. So for the one and a half listeners of Still Unbelievable who haven't heard of you and don't know about you, tell us a little bit about yourselves and remind them where they can find you and what you do. Yeah, I have a podcast called uh, Graceful Atheist Podcast. It tends to focus on deconversion stories. Uh, so people in the process of deconstruction, in the process of deconversion, or years afterwards. Another element of it is my brand of humanism that I call secular grace. And this is just this idea of, you know, the best parts of religion are really about how we treat one another and, and loving each other and, and trying to find practical, uh, modern and secular ways to do that. And, uh, and the third element is this idea of an honesty contest is, is I don't know about you, but for, for me, a lot of that deconversion process was just being honest with myself and having honesty contests, quote unquote, with uh, with other believers to just be vulnerable, to be uh, direct and honest. And, I, and here I don't mean to hit somebody over the head with a cudgel, but rather self-honesty, right? Uh, to talk about the, as Andrew just mentioned off mic a few minutes ago, how difficult the deconversion process is, how painful mm -hmm. it is physically and mentally. And, and I think when we're just kind of truthful, that that connects to people. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, David. And yes, I want to acknowledge and uh, affirm that it is difficult. We and others do, do each other a disservice if we don't recognise that. But I think those of us who've been through it, we all universally accept that. So it's just an, un, it's an unstated acknowledgement, I hope. The reason why I've asked you on, David, Andrew and myself were each separately over on the podcast Skeptics and Seekers answering the question, would we worship a God? And it just so happened that Andrew and I were on separate episodes having that conversation. It just worked out that way. 
Well, I said to Andrew, I'd actually like to have that conversation together on Still Unbelievable because we haven't actually addressed that ourselves as hosts of Still Unbelievable. So I wanted to do that. But to make it more interesting, I wanted to bring on another friendly face, so to speak, or friendly voice, as it's an audio podcast, on to talk around the same subject ourselves, because I'm sure you have a slightly different perspective, even though maybe the bulk of our answers might be be similar. So that's why I've got you on. And thank you for being uh, open for that. Let's just get the the easy bit out of the way first and just ask the question straight. I've got a couple of notes that I do want to follow, but let's just ask the question straight out. If you were to find out that a God existed, would you worship it? And that's to all three of us. So I'm going to say, no, I don't think I could worship that God. OK, so here I go. I'm, Matthew, I'm going to do my best to give a different answer than I've given in the past to this question and then try to provide as we move along some rationality for it. And so, so the answer is actually very provisionally yes. I, I know that's surprising. and it, I'm shocked. I, I know, I know, I know. Uh, so just mind the very provisional part because there's some nuance here that I discovered while doing a little bit more research for this show. So I don't think it's actually going to change my answer from the past. We'll go through it a little bit at a time as we go on, but I don't want to take up a big long time here monologuing about it. And so in the part where I might say, yes, I'll be interested to, to hear what you guys have to say. And I and we just agree on the no part on the no part. So, so there it is. The answer is probably still no, but I'm going to say provisionally yes to see if we can make something interesting out of it. Typical Apple user can't make his mind up. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, oh. I'll have you know they have an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Andrew, you stole my answer. I want to answer a slightly different question. Matthew, I think about a month ago you tweeted the question, if you found the God that you believed in, that you used to believe in, was real, would you worship that God? That's slightly different. And my answer to that is very close to Andrew's. Provisionally, yes. And the, there's a lot of caveats there that we'll get into. Um, and my, I think the point that to make it very quickly is that the God that I believed in was very graceful, was very loving and kind, and you know was a God in my image, right? <laughs> so, so of course I loved that God. Part of my deconversion was the discovery that the God of the Bible wasn't the same as the God that I had worshipped, and that's part of why I yeah. deconverted and why maybe the answer would ultimately be no. So I don't remember that tweet. Something must have sparked it. I think I must have seen that question somewhere else. I thought, you know what, that's a, that's a good question because... To answer that specific question, the God I used to believe in, it, that's an emphatic no for me because I don't like that God. Mm -hmm. And I've said multiple times mm -hmm. on this podcast, if I was to ever go back to Christianity, it would be a very different Christianity. And I would look to model the kind of Christianity that Steve Chalk yeah. resembles and, and emits. And for those of you who are not in the UK, you don't recognise that name go two years back in the back catalogue of Still Unbelievable, you'll find the interview with Andrew and myself with Steve Chalk, and I still follow Steve on Twitter. And his tweets are utterly rampacked full of grace, human grace. He's not an apologist. He, he doesn't, his tweets aren't about converting people. His tweets are about caring for people. Right. Yeah, Steve was an interesting guest to have on just just briefly in, in case people are wondering, you know, okay, so you make a, a back catalog reference and sometimes it seems like, well, we just want people to listen more, right? And certainly that's true, but Steve's a guest worth hearing for American ears. He's got a, an incredibly large ministry in the United Kingdom. For me, that wasn't his most interesting accolade. He is well recognized, uh, so well recognized around the world uh, at, at having a a ministry, if you will, that is that is human oriented, that he has actually worked in an advisory capacity for the United Nations. And uh, and I found that his his most interesting accolade. I think uh, to some extent, if you're a person of faith and uh, you manage to do well enough with it that you're recognized by an organization like the United Nations, 
which is which is hopefully multicultural and interested in the best uh, outcome for as many human beings as possible. If you can be that kind of minister, you've probably got some things that you will say that, that people should hear. Go have a listen to Steve because we do want the listens. Um, <laughs> it was a yeah. interesting guest so. Very well done, Andrew. Very well done. Absolutely. We need a bingo card for how many back catalog references we can hit in this <laughs> Uh, but there is a there is a but coming uh, on this is I don't actually need to be a Christian and I don't actually need to worship a God to be as awesome a caring person as Steve Chalk. And David, you on your own podcast, you push this idea of secular grace, about being graceful to people. And we hear it every single episode that you do about caring for people. You don't need to worship a God to exude that kind of care for your for your fellow people. So if I'm going to consider that kind of Christianity, that doesn't help the question that we're asking and answering here about worshipping a deity. So worship doesn't mean being nice to other people necessarily. Right. It, It might be a part of it. And I'm sure Christians would love to own that as part of worship. And I'm sure you could squeeze a definition i'm I'm doing a link here guys hold on for it i'm sure you could squeeze into the definition of worship being nice to people or being graceful to people but it's not necessary and it's not and it's not an exclusive characteristic so when somebody asks you the question would you worship a god what goes through your mind? I'm going to go reverse order this time, David. So what goes yeah. through your mind when somebody asks you the question worship? What does worship mean for you in the context of this question? And how does that then inform your answer? Wow, I'm trying to figure out how to how to answer this, because the question implies that such a God exists or a God exists. Yes, right. And so, I mean, that 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 changes the equation, because the way that I come at it, from the re- the real world <laughs> is that religion is a human phenomenon, right? Mm-hmm. It's a cultural phenomenon. It is our uh, attempt to collectively figure the world out and have purpose and meaning and and inspire morality and what have you. And as you rightly point out, a, a deity, a supernatural deity, isn't a part of that. Isn't necessarily a part of that equation. Uh, but if we're saying that a deity did exist uh, and it was deserving of of worship i would imagine that would include prayer some kind of dedication <laughs> some kind of spiritual practices uh, disciplines there's the word i was looking for spiritual disciplines to in some way interact with with such a deity picking up on that it sounds like for you worship is a two-way street uh, yes i think i think again part of the the issue with Uh, Christianity as we experienced it or many of the people that I interview is that they really believed that the Christian God existed and we're trying to have a relationship. It's a religion. It's a relationship, not a religion. Right. uh, And when you're trying to do that one sided, eventually you wake up and go, I'm alone here. And that's the deconversion process. But if we were saying that such a deity actually existed and there really was a relationship, it absolutely would be it would have to be a two way street. Yes, absolutely. This is my brain has gone off on a tangent here. It it fits. So hang with me, guys, but you're going to burst out laughing. When I first came to boarding school here in the UK and it went into the door room, one of the lads opened up his case and very treasuringly brought out this pristine life size poster of Debbie Harry from the band Blondie. Yeah. That, that that dates me <laughs> work it out guys <laughs> and put it up on the wall and that got a huge amount of adoration from all the teenage boys in, <laughs> in the door room because it was it was the 80s by the end of the school year the poster wasn't getting anywhere near the same adoration it had some rips on it it had some marks on it the poster wasn't giving back so the the care and the attention it was getting waned to practically zero you're describing the same thing yeah yeah uh recently i asked the question uh you know because music is so powerful uh, you know what is your deconversion song what's what's the song when you hear it 
it makes you think about that process, maybe even makes you sad, right? And for me, it's one that uh, Ryan Bell mentioned in like 2017, but it's a uh, uh, great big worlds say something I'm giving up on you. And of course, the song is written about a, a relationship, you know, a romantic relationship, but the, it's so eloquent. It's, you know, say something. I'm on my way out. I need you to respond. <laughs> and, you know, it, it really captures that feeling of if you're real, I need you to show me this. I need you to interact with me. And it's that mm -hmm. deafening silence that is the problem. Yeah. You know, I think yes. for me, I, I <laughs> so Matthew has, Matthew has dated himself. I guess I'll, I guess I'll follow in the fine tradition and say my deconversion song would probably be Jacob's Ladder by Huey Lewis and the News. So the beginning of the song, you, you've got this, uh, you've got these opening lines. I, I met a fan dancer down in the south side of Birmingham. She was running from a fat man selling salvation in his hand. Um, then the next line is, I'm, I'm doing all right, the best that I can. And I think that was uh, how I felt when I walked away from Christianity. I'm, I'm doing all right without it. Uh, and right. the people that I see trying to sell me their brand of salvation, I, do, I don't think they're all fat. You know, this is, this is, there's not a fat joke in our future here. Uh, but I do largely see them uh, as people who are doing no better than I'm doing. Mm. And I think that that is the biggest problem for me. If you want me to believe that your God can make my life better, your group should be better than my life is. Mm, yeah. And and if it's not, I'm doing all right. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, so it's, there you are. I remember that question coming up on Twitter, David, and I thought long and hard about it. I thought, do I have one? Because no song immediately jumped to my mind. And I spent a couple of days thinking and I didn't have an answer and I still don't have an answer. And I think the reason is I was a huge consumer of Christian bands and worship music. I had loads of those CDs and those are what I would play in the car going to work. Right. And around about the time I started deconstructing, I got a job where I was working at home and I found podcasts. So I did this almost instant change from listening to Christian based music to listening to podcasts and right. people talking and, and science and disseminating information rather than just uh, having a, a holy hop along. So I don't think there's a song for me that jumps out. Yeah, I'm sure I could. There are any number that I could get to fit, but it's a difficult question for me to answer because I just genuinely can't answer it because of my circumstances. But hey ho, the question to me then: How? What springs to my mind? Worship. Mentally, I picture something organised. You know, here, here in the UK, we've got uh, the Church of England, and you go into certain brands of the Church of England, and the people leading the service. It's men in dresses. It's, it's so disrespectful. <laughs> you know, they have their specific outfits for the roles that they perform and there are movements that they perform. And you go to certain circumstances and certain services, rather, and it's called Smells and Bells. And you'll get a procession of people down the church and they'll swing incense. You know, and this is the High Church of England. This isn't Roman Catholicism. Right. And it's all, all very formalised, almost ritual. And so part of my mind goes to this ritual part of worship. Well, obviously, worship isn't more, isn't just that. It's a state of mind. It's a mental state. And from my evangelical background, for me, worship is about a state of mind, having God or the idea of God at the forefront of your mind in, in everything that you do, asking yourself the question, is what I'm doing or is what I'm about to do something that would glorify God? And it wasn't until I got out that I found that actually that mental state is quite draining and quite tiring. So I balance those two kinds of things in my mind uh, in worship. And that's probably why I consumed an awful lot of Christian music. When I was driving to work, I had my favourite bands in the CD player. Yes, Petra was uh, among yeah. them. 
Wow. And, and the Worldwide Message Tribe for for my UK friends. Never really got into Newsboys, but yeah, Petra and Worldwide Message Tribe were, were the big ones. I even had a rave Christian CD by a band called Zero, I think it was. So yeah, I, and I had some obscure ones. You know, the band with no name, I think, and uh, uh, and others. Hydro, I can I can name lots and lots. And some of these music I listened to some not long ago. Some of this music which I haven't listened to for a decade, more than a decade, I still know extraordinarily well. And it was quite depressing to know that you know over these years of not listening, I still know it so well. But that that was what I did. And sometimes my entire commute to work would be me performing an act of worship, listening to this Christian music, sometimes backing up a song and doing the same song again. So for me, worship picks up quite a lot of different notes. Uh, but I would guess that the predominant one that I would probably fall down to would be this uh, keeping the idea of a, of a God that you want to please uh, in the front of my mind. But to go back to some a comment I made earlier about I don't like the God I used to believe in. There's a reason why I don't like the God I used to believe in. There's a book that had a huge effect on me. And this is a, a few years before I properly started deconstructing, well, probably actually 10 years before I started deconstructing. This, I don't think this had a significant impact on my journey. But it was a book called The Road to Hell. I remember one of the things that struck me about what the author wrote in the book was that you know, Jesus' teaching in hell, on hell was either always or mostly just to his disciples or those around him. He didn't talk about hell when he was preaching to people. He talked about hell when he was in conversation with those around him. And, and again, for for listeners, reasonpress at gmail.com, feel free to fact check me on that, because if I'm misremembering the book that I've read or misremembering something, I want to know. So I'm not going to fact check this because I just can't be bothered to read the Bible, but feel free to fact check me and email if me if I've got something wrong but that's the memory I have of this book but the effect that that had on me was I was in a leadership position at the time doing youth work and so that book really had a profound effect on me to the point where it actually instilled a fear in me that if I lead these children wrong if I make a mistake leading these children wrong will God snatch my salvation from me and replace it with hell i don't know how long that fear lasted but it obviously dissipated after a while but it really did have that kind of an impact on me and the the overriding thought i have about that now is fear is not a good motivator of good behavior and if that's what it took for me to think about being a good leader then i should not have been in leadership and if that's what it takes for people to be a Christian, they should not be a Christian. Christianity is more than just about worshipping God because you want to worship God. It's about being saved from a punishment that you are destined to have unless you worship. And it's that bit that I object to. And it's that bit that was an essential characteristic of a God that I used to believe in. And that's why I can't worship that God, because there is no way on this earth or in heaven that I can like that God. I think it is important to recognize that people have, and I've said this before, that, that the word God is the most overloaded term in the English language. That mm -hmm. it, So as you're describing that, Matthew, I hear, you know, lots of the people that I interview that rapture anxiety, hell anxiety that they still deal with, you know, years after deconversion and, and it breaks my heart. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet my experience was different. Like I, I came into the church and I thought almost exactly the opposite, like, you know, that that the focus of the church on hell was incorrect. And I had my verses to go point out why that was the case. I came to understand that I had rose colored glasses on, that I was filtering things through grace glasses, as it were. <laughs> and part of that realization was recognizing that other people felt exactly the opposite of me. But my point is that people's experiences can be radically different. And so your conception of God is different than what mine was. And I just I want to tie us into I think what started this conversation was Cameron Bartuzzi's rather snarky trollish tweet about <laughs> how Atheists wouldn't worship God even if he, the God was proven. And it's your experience is why most 
atheists or more, mm. most former Christians respond with that gut level reaction of hell no, <laughs> you know, yeah. and why that is so confusing to somebody like Bartuzzi is he has the rose colored glasses on still. All he's seeing is the, the loving kind portions of that. And he's not feeling that visceral fear uh, that you're describing. Yeah. Good point. So if we believed in different concepts of God, one of us could never have been a proper Christian. Right. Exactly. No, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and I so, think if you asked a thousand people, even in the same church, you would get a thousand variations. Right. And uh, that's the that's the problem. The thing that I think I have the biggest problem. Uh, so I'll go ahead and parse out this bit about maybe yes for, from earlier. Worship has a wide variety of meanings. Ask a dozen Christians on any given day and you'll get 13 answers, right? <laughs> because worship means a lot of, it's, it's not maybe as overloaded as God, but it's probably not far off, to be honest. So by worship, simply mean adoration. There might be a God that, that I would worship, that I would feel kindly toward. I, I think largely there'd have to be this two-way street that you were talking about earlier, Dave because I don't see how I can have adoration, which is deep love and respect, right? So it's not a not a hard word, but if you don't know the definition, it's fine. It's, it's, it's deep love, respect. So maybe I would have adoration for some God. It, it wouldn't be the God that, that I thought existed as a Christian, because frankly, that God was the worst version of me. Sinners in the hands of an angry God, and the angrier, the better, right? Mm. That, uh, the the sodomites and sinners deserved what they were going to get. And and um, if I'm being honest, some days I was quite gleeful about the fact that I would I would uh, probably not see them in hell, but I would get to watch God judge them and send some people left and others right. And so I think the God that I worshipped was the worst version of me. Hmm. And I have said on this show in the past that when I separated myself from Christianity, I became a better person. And now you know why. The God I worship was probably the worst version. But is it possible that there's a God that I could worship if we just mean love and adoration, if we just mean deep respect, if, if we just mean a, a God that I would align myself because he is as kind to others as I want the world to be for us all. And not only is he that kind, but he does it better than I do because he has better knowledge of the future and better understanding of outcomes and the best possible way to open this world up so that we can all live better. Of course, I would respect that person deeply. Of course, I would. Here's the no, and here's what I think most people mean by worship. Would I honor that that being with religious ritual? Would I uh, would I pretend to eat that God's body and drink that God's blood on Sundays? The answer to that is hell no. And this goes for a lot of the religious ritual and tradition that I see in the world. Far, far too often, the religious rituals that we practice, the traditions that we use to honor these gods that we make up are the worst versions of ourselves. We hear it in our preaching that you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God is the most famous. But we preach that kind of sermon every Sunday. And even if it was, a, even if there was a good God out there, that somehow commanded this sort of religious honoring. I'd have to say no to that because there is a part of me that thinks that that is deeply, deeply flawed. And if you guys want, we can get into why I think that's deeply flawed. That is why there's a no and why I think and what I think most people mean by worship, right? This, this sort of religious honoring. My answer there is a, is a hard no. Yeah, I'd probably so, go a bit stronger than you on that, Andrew. I, channeling uh, our friend uh, David Johnson over from Skeptic and Seekers here, where I think that the, the whole concept of worship is, is deeply immoral. 
I, I'll genuinely go that far. I, I don't think it's an appropriate response to any being, regardless of how perfect they are. And I'm going to go even further and say that I don't think a perfect being would want to be worshipped because I think the whole concept and the whole idea, idea and the whole practice of worship, because of the moral aspects and, uh, that I think of it, actually lessens creation. So if I was a being that was perfect and created everything, I don't think that that creation worshipping me improves that creation at all. I think it lessens it. It single-mindedly focuses attentions of that creation to the detriment of everything else. And to me, the whole concept of that is more than immoral. It's just utterly dumbfoundedly illogical. <laughs> so I think there's... <laughs> Uh, there's a huge, huge problem there with that whole build up and, uh, and that whole structure. Uh, I'm going to say it again, and listeners, I'm sorry, I know you've heard me say this probably about three times already. As a parent, I do not want my child to worship me. I have a much better relationship with my child because she answers me back. I have a much better relationship with my child because she challenges me when she thinks I've got bathed or goofed or said something wrong she would tell me before I've even opened my mouth don't say that joke I'd much rather have my child have that relationship with me because it's a productive adult relationship yes on an equal footing because damn it she has a mind of her own you know her mm. mind and her personality are not an extension of me she is herself and she should be entitled and she should have a right to behave that way. And her challenging me and in her saying, don't say that about my friend or don't say that in front of my friend because it's just dumb and no, you're not cool. OK, fair enough. And maybe the, the pat response of I'm your dad, it's my job to embarrass you. Maybe that gets tired after a while. You know, maybe I need to listen to my daughter and actually respond a little differently sometimes. Mm. And that doesn't happen. If I require my daughter to always obey me without question and to worship me when not. And right, that is the relationship that Christianity builds up, up with God. And if we can see that it harms us as humans, then why the hell can't we see that it harms us as people? There's a subtle difference. I think. So I agree with everything you said, but it, what I said, I think, has a, a subtle but important difference. The God that I would be willing to worship in, to the limited extent that I suggested, which was to have some deep love and, and respect for, uh, and that only, uh, would necessarily not be a God that required it. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. I would take it one step further that, uh, you know, would a perfect God be worthy of worship? Yes. Would a perfect God require need or even want worship no yeah that's nicely parsed uh, and it, and the distinction is that this is clearly not the guy the god of the old and the new testament yes. right i'm i'm going to push back on that because i've defined worship and the whole concept of worship as immoral and dumbfoundedly illogical <laughs> i would say that a perfect god does not deserve that because you're disrespecting that god by worshiping it well that's interesting how so because worship is immoral and illogical uh, and so you're badly treating that god interesting so, so that is that is uh that is also nicely parsed uh that, <laughs> that there could be uh, that the nature of worship itself is a logical contradiction for a perfect god that's uh that's nicely conceived David, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I if I entirely buy into that it is immoral uh, at all levels. Again, I, I for me the the critical bit is that a a a perfect God would not want that, yeah. right? Like the uh, so in the same way that you just discuss describe as a parent, you don't want that from your child. A perfect God would not want that from it, its creation. And I think the key element for me is Christians tend to look at, say, the Greek pantheon or the Roman gods and say, oh, look, they, you know, even Paul says this, 
they're based off of, of humans. You know, they have human desires and human uh, failures and such without recognizing that the God of both the Old Testament and the New Testament has precisely the exact same human qualities, failures, mm -hmm. uh, problems, right? And so it, we are definitely not describing a perfect deity that is – a perfect deity would be complete and whole in itself. It would not yes. require or need anything <laughs> outside That's of true. itself. And okay. the very fact that the God of the Old Testament, New Testament needs worship is a problem. Yeah, I'm going to take that a little bit further. And I'm going to, I didn't think I was going to end up here today. This was definitely not in my mindset. But thank you for bringing me here, David. In human fiction that touches the supernatural, all of the entities that demand and expect and extract worship on pain of death or torture are the bad ones. That is proof that the Christian God is an evil God. Mm -hmm. So that actually borders on another part of the answer I gave over on the on skeptics and seekers. And that is, I might actually go through the trappings of worship, uh, go through the motions of worship. If I thought there was God who had decided that I could go to hell or heaven, and if I lived a good life minus worship, he would send me to hell. But if I lived that same life with some trappings of worship, uh, he might send me to heaven. I might, I might selfishly worship. Now, I, I realize that that's um, in some sense orthogonal to what we usually mean by worship, right? Because worship is not supposed to have a, a, a sort of selfish component. I don't see how it cannot, but that's, that's the idea. So in the same way that I might pay the mob boss, right? <laughs> if somebody, somebody doesn't, uh, so that he doesn't break my kneecaps, I might go through that in order not to be tortured for all eternity. But at that point, it, it, once again, I think we've left any sort of common definition of what we mean by worship. Right. Yeah, I think if I ended up in that place, I'd be very, very confused. If there was, there was a God, if the Christian concept of God turned out to be real, it would genuinely confuse me. And I wouldn't want know what to do with myself. And yet we have a lawyer friend that actually... That's that's the God our lawyer friend does worship, uh, Matthew. So and you, she scares me. I've said okay. this over in Skeptics and Seekers when she talks about morality and attitudes. Right. She genuinely scares me. Yeah. yeah. Just like to, to just do a pause here, David, you mentioned the uh, Cameron Butizzi tweet, or it was actually on his Facebook page, I think, um, that he put out, but it doesn't really matter where it was. So I'll just read it out. And But I think we've addressed all of the comments on it. But just in case anyone is thinking about this tweet. And so I'll read this out here. And it says in full, many atheists, in quotes, even if God were real, I wouldn't worship him. Yeah, we covered that. Also atheists, understands without reservation that when a person does something good, praising them is an appropriate response. I think we've covered that. There's all sorts that are wrong with the logic on that tweet, not to mention the whole equating praise with worship. And, you know, my I actually responded to that on this page, uh, a suitably sarcastic when I tell my God that my dog, <laughs> that she's a good girl for well behaving. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm not worshipping her. Yeah. We all praise people, whether it's our work colleagues, whether it's our pets, whether it's our children when something goes well we congratulate them and yes that's praise but we're not praising in the christian sense of worship you know we're giving somebody mm. due recognition for what it is that they've done because being congratulated for doing something well is a great motivator what does god need motivating to do if god is already perfect surely we're the ones that need motivating this is back to my uh, evil god thing again so there's all sorts going on in that tweet that's wrong and i'm pretty sure that we covered it uh, all now can i address that uh, try to steel man it just a little bit uh so we've had the discussion of worship and whether or not that is moral or not but let's let's take it kind of in with cameron's presuppositions uh that let's use the word praise instead of worship so we don't get hung up on that this is where if that god 
existed and that God was worthy of praise, I just I, w- I don't have any problem with saying yes there. That just doesn't bother me in the same way. And and let me step back one more thing. I really find this distinction between uh, people who grew up in the church. So you were a child uh, and your parents taught you Christianity and maybe a heavy handed version of that. There's a really distinct distinction for people who then come to it later in life. And even though I was a teenager, I did come into it later in life and had just a little bit of separation uh, so that I, you know, I didn't have that fear of hell. I didn't have that ingrained. Uh, and so, again, my when I reflect back on that today, it's that I was I had too rosy a picture. I was I was filtering out the negative aspects and just seeing the loving, kind worthy aspects. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, if Cameron were listening, you know, I, I I have no problem saying yes to that question, uh, the way the way that he intends it. And and I I understand why Christians are frustrated sometimes when atheists immediately respond with, no, I definitely wouldn't. Because in their mind, they're only they're only thinking of all these good aspects, all these this is wonderful. This is why they can't like, why would you not accept this wonderful offer of salvation from their perspective, right? And mm. it, it, I get it. I remember what that felt like. I remember thinking that. And it, it isn't until you kind of raise your head up a little bit and get a slightly bigger picture that you recognize that there aren't really any different. There's not major differences between Christianity and other major existing religions and that there's no, you know, if such a God actually exists, we w- there would be no doubt. There would be no question. We wouldn't be having this conversation, right? If such a God existed, everyone would know this fact. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, this wouldn't be a debate in any way or at all. Uh, and the fact that it is a debate is a problem. Yes. You know, just, just looking at this from the perfect God perspective, So uh, not really taking uh, issue with what you said, David, but there is a bit of reasoning here that bothers me. Under the perfect God model, a God that does something praiseworthy could not have done otherwise because it's not in his nature to have the capacity to choose any avenue other than the correct, uh, other other than the thing that will maximize whatever whatever his goals are, right? He, He can't do otherwise. And when we, I, I take it, at least I think when the three of us are using the word praise, one of the things that we necessarily mean is that somehow someone did something good when there was the capacity to do otherwise. So when Matthew talked about his dog, which is, I recognize to all the listeners, a rather trivial example. But the reason we praise our pets when they do something good is because they have the capacity to do otherwise. When we praise our children for uh, making a, a good ethical decision, it's because they had the capacity to do otherwise. And I don't understand what it means to praise a God who doesn't have the capacity to do otherwise. So I completely understand what you're saying. I, I think we are, I think this podcast, our discussion so far, we've slightly over parsed the word worship, over parsed <laughs> the word praise. And again, I'm trying to get into Cameron's head. Right? Sure. Sure. And address what Cameron means when he says those things. I understand us. I get the atheist. Perspective. I understand why we are resistant to it. But that it, Cameron is not thinking out about it from the perspective of could he have done otherwise? He, you know what I mean? He is thinking. Right. I don't know what the model of God he has. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I completely he, agree. Uh, like, you know, he is thinking of it from the, from the perspective of in his mind, this is the ultimate goodness the ultimate kindness and love and grace and mercy and the strong attitude of atheists against that is dumbfounding literally right. like Completely how could perplexing. you how could you yeah. think that how could you possibly reject that and so i'm just trying to acknowledge that although i think it's incorrect because i used to think that and i think i was mistaken <laughs> i get it i understand the perspective yeah not Thank pushing for- back on that at all Sorry, yeah. Matthew, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm not pushing back either. I just want to acknowledge and thank you for saying that, Dave, because it's nice to hear somebody who does get it, because I don't. It's yeah. my, my, my mind isn't parsing that in that way. I've read explained that the idea of a, 
a perfect God just doesn't work with me. It doesn't fit, certainly not under Christianity. And worse still, you know, in the decades since I've deconstructed and with the conversations that I've been, I've seen a huge number of hurt and damaged people. And we had a bit of conversation about this uh, offline before we went on to Mike. And so I cannot have the conversation about worship of perfect God without those people, those conversations, those hurt minds being within my own mind without being in, in my thoughts. And their existence makes it impossible for me to conceive the kind of God that that you and presumably Cameron are, are talking about. I just can't get there with that God because I don't see it with what I've seen online in the damaged people who are just discarded by the Christianity that I that I see. So I, I agree. I mean, what what I said earlier about, you know, kids growing up in that indoctrination, like I it breaks my heart, like especially the 90s kids who went through the kiss dating goodbye. They are, you know, their entire their sexuality, their, you know, all of this, their identity is all messed up and, and they're recovering. You know, we're seeing the aftermath of that at this point. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to I don't want to <laughs> mix up what I'm saying. I, I think that Christianity and all supernatural religions are incorrect because they aren't true and untrue things have damaging effects. So I don't want to I don't want to minimize that in any way. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying yeah. I also remember what it was like to be 100 percent convinced. And so when I am talking to a believer, I'm I put myself in that mindset, right? Like that that when Cameron says that, I I get why he is confused is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, right. I get that. And, and thank you for elucidating that, David. Now I know why it was a good idea to bring you on to this episode. Yes. <laughs> so I'd like to I'd like to explore this path a little bit more, actually, because I think it's genuinely interesting. I know what the Christian response to my criticism is going to be. Um, so I'd like to try and unpack that. So the Christian response is going to be you're judging the people and they're failed people and they're imperfect people. So, of course, they're going to have a bad effect around them and some of them will have a devastating effect on those around them. You're judging the perfect God on the imperfect actions of his imperfect worshippers. How do we unpack that response? It seems to me pretty easy. Show me his perfect actions. <laughs> OK, fair enough. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, really, I know that sounds... Trite? <laughs> Yeah, but I, look, some, sometimes it comes with, when you say something that short, yeah. right? It, it it can sound uh, it can sound dismissive in a way that it's not intended. Now, frankly, that time it was <laughs> it was intended as dismissive as it sounded. But it, even if I said it in a different tone of voice, so I don't want to lie to the listener. Yes, it was it was trite. It was every bit as dismissive as it sounded. But even if I'd said it in a in a much kinder tone, it would not have been less dismissive. If you want me to believe that there's a perfect God, well, it's pretty easy. He yeah. should know how to do that. It, it's not up to me necessarily to uh, look at someone and try to figure out whether their action was perfect. There should be some standard that, that a perfect God introduced into an imperfect world to be able to discern what actions were perfect and what actions were imperfect. Why? Because that's how I would follow that God. Now, it may very well be. It wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't eliminate the, the Christian version of libertarian free will, because I may very well still decide that, that I like living in my sin, whatever it is. You know, I, uh, I like wearing red shirts on Sunday and those are prohibited or, or whatever. Right. And I may just very well like red more than I like the notion of not wearing red. And so I keep doing it. But to suggest that there is a perfect God who is viewable through his imperfect worshipers and I can look at them and discover his his perfection is to simply offer an unfalsifiable as far as I can tell. I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. But as far as I can tell, it's just the kind of unfalsifiable word salad 
um, that that needs to be discarded until better ideas come along. Yeah, I don't think there's much I can really say on that because you do get straight onto my whole deconstruction story. You know, it's the the Debbie Harry poster. Yeah, it's this image of God, which was just an image. There was never any feedback. You know, you know certainly not at the times that I asked for it and begged for it. I need it the most. So that's basically where I go with that one and say, yeah, OK, you say your God's perfect. I don't have the experience to support that. David, you're good at still manning this stuff. What do you think? <laughs> Well, I'm going to try to avoid being trite as well, uh, because my answer is is the Bible. For me, uh, as I said, I had you know a very grace-colored glasses perspective on on God, and I think that Christians, believers in general, whatever their ancient text is, you have your favorite bits, and you read those most often, <laughs> and you quote them to to each other, and and you tend to ignore the vast bulk of the rest of those ancient texts. And for me, a major portion of the uh, deconversion was a reread through the Bible about two years before I deconverted. And I think I've told this story on this podcast before, so sorry to your listeners for hearing it again. But I was rereading that, you know, doing one of those year through the Bible kind of things. And and my wife was noticing I was angry. I was really like, you know, I'm like right after reading the Bible. And, and what it was was it was – it was actually destroying my conception of God. If if you just read the entirety of the Old and New Testaments, and not just the bits that you like, and try to come at it from the perspective of what if I were seeing this for the first time rather than what everyone has already taught me, but what does it actually say? Uh, it's a dark, dark picture. Mm. And my reference earlier to the idea that Christians think of the Greek pantheon as obviously human fabrications, that comes across quite clearly when you when you read the, particularly the Old Testament, but even many elements of the New Testament. And so when I when my the question was, how do we unpack the the accusation that it is imperfect people <laughs> that uh, we are judging God by? I'm saying, well, I'm judging. God, not by the people, but by the book that is purportedly inspired by him. Yes. But we also can't really mm. get away from the people effect, really, because it's a book that's written, translated, distributed by these people, interpreted in sermons by these people. It's impossible for it not to come through a filter of a person. I totally agree. But my point is from the Christian perspective, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, so yes. I, I absolutely encourage Christians to read their Bibles. Please do. Please read every page of it. And uh, <laughs> like uh, and I don't mean that in a snarky way. I mean, you should actually know it. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's see, there are some things that no matter how you say them, it's the, the snark gun is loaded. And, and, you know, it's going to fire on certain phrases like, yeah, I encourage Christians to read their Bible. There's no <laughs> way for that. Yes. To do. <laughs> yeah. Right. So um, move it. Key. Sorry, did you want to say something? I was going to move it on oh, slightly, Andrew. Yeah. So I, I want you to just just very briefly. I wanted to say that. So, David, you, you helped me understand uh, Cameron's perspective. You, you still made him quite well. I do want to say that. If you take Cameron's position and you just can't understand how atheists uh, get to a we wouldn't worship God perspective, uh, even with even with the best still manning that I think has been done here, and he may use different words that would give him a, a better hearing. But even so, if your idea of a perfect God uh, is that his nature is that he can't do otherwise. Uh, e even in the even in the best hearing, it still doesn't make sense to praise. So there, there you are. That was that was it. And uh, David, I'll give you the last bite of the apple <laughs> or, or Matthew. Well, I know that Cameron is, you know, a philosopher as well. And so I imagine that you and Cameron could have that conversation about uh, I, I think I think personally, one of the major problems of Christianity is they use free will as a theodicy, as an explanation for mm -hmm. the problem of evil. And that as soon as you accept that, then you have to ask the question of, well, is God free? <laughs> and and you fall right. into that. What I think is just a black hole of, of yeah. you know, you 
you're never going to get anywhere there. But that it's an interesting philosophical question uh, because none of us believe that any of it is is real. It, I, I don't right. see how useful it is. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I've been trounced by philosophers before. I'll be glad to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> we probably need to have that free will discussion now, Andrew, but not tonight. Okay, but moving it on a little bit, but staying on the same subject and things that Christians say. Andrew and I are over here here on Still and Believe will have done two 10 questions from Christians shows. One of them was Braxton Hunter's 10 questions YouTube video of last year. And then another one was an old one of about 10, 11 years ago now, the, the video was, but we only re- this year did the answers. But in both videos, the final question was, if I could convince you to your satisfaction that a God existed, would you worship it? Now, we've already answered the would you worship it bit. So the question is, and maybe we're going to get these answers wrong because we're not Christians now, but what is this obsession with Christians in asking that question of us? Because it feels to me like a gotcha question. It feels like it's the kind of question where they're pretty confident that we're going to say no. And then they can go, ha ha, you see, you just don't want to. You just want to wallow in your sin. You just want to go and bonk everyone that you want to. You just want to do this and therefore you don't want to accept the god we know that's the the retort that's coming why would christians be motivated in going down that road on this question and that's David, a gotcha question, question in itself <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah I'm, it's that's interesting framing um i i agree that it's probably it, it, maybe even unconsciously a bit of a gotcha question whether they are aware of that or or not i would go back to how utterly convinced they are and how confused they are that anyone could think otherwise. This is the issue, right? Is like yeah. when, if you have a conversation at, at the, as the typical atheist does and say to a believer, well, you don't believe in Santa Claus, do you? You've immediately lost that person yeah. because to them, their entire worldview, their entire conception of reality has just been challenged in a facile way from their yeah. perspective. Even though from our perspective, these are the same. It's the same question. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when someone like Cameron asks this or or Braxton or what have you, it's because they cannot imagine the other side is as we are struggling to understand their side or to remember what it felt like to be on their side. They have never experienced our side, so they have no reference point of what that's like. They can only assume that it is. Well, let me give you one more example. I've had multiple believers refer me to C.S. Lewis's uh, The Great Divorce, mm-hmm. uh, and I, and in, including one of my first guests, uh, David Helliston. I read that a few months after that, and I was just shocked at <laughs> why would they want me to read this? Because it struck me as Christian fan fiction. It goes back to what Andrew was talking about, about kind of this – joy in the the punishment in that the, the the premise of this is that the premise of the great divorce is that people are in hell because they choose to be there because they choose to reject this wonderful loving giving god right and that not one person in hell is there because god chose to be them to be there but because they chose to be there and it really is christian fan fiction first of all it's not biblical in any way <laughs> uh, uh, and secondly, it's very facile. It's very childlike. You know, it's very um, even for C.S. Lewis. <laughs> so wow. uh, my, my, my point I'm trying to get at is. As, as a Christian, you're re- reading that book, you know, you think, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You know, that people uh, choose to reject God because they want to sin. They want their they want to, you know, raise their fist at the sky and say no. And yet what they don't get is what we're saying is. We have to establish that a God exists at all, that there's any credible evidence <laughs> uh, beyond cultural artifacts that that such a God existed. And that is just a completely foreign concept is what I'm trying to get across. And so, mm. uh, of course, they frame the story in atheists hate God. Uh, you know what I mean? That all of us are frustrated by that because we don't. How can you hate something you don't think exists? Uh, but from their perspective, there's no other way to think about it. I genuinely don't get the fascination with C.S. Lewis. As a Christian, I started reading Screwtape Letters 
and I started reading Mere Christianity. I didn't even get a quarter of the way through either of them before yeah. I put them down. I just simply did the guy, and that's as a Christian. Right. Could not get on with them. Yeah. And it was so long ago, I can't even remember what it was like reading them. And I'm so unmotivated to even bother because of that previous experience. I simply don't get this fascination. It's almost like they're worshipping him as a deity. Sometimes it feels like. Uh, yeah, I mean, so here, let's in the, in the spirit of steel, steel manning, uh, C.S. Lewis's best book is A Grief Observed. And the reason it's his best book is because it's honest. <laughs> it's real emotion. He's a human being in that book. Uh, uh, but yes, I, you know, I read C.S. Lewis early on in my Christianity. I've reread it as an atheist. I find it, you know, not that interesting <laughs> in either case, and I I don't understand the obsession with them. Yeah. You know, I hate to I hate to be this way about questions, but sometimes it's possible to ask a question that I think is fundamentally starts off the rails, and. I often think when I, I get asked this question all the time, if I could prove I, I live in a in an extended family of Pentecostal Christians. And uh, whenever we talk, there's this implied. If I could if I could just convince Andrew that there was a God, would he, you know, because I'm an out atheist now. And, I just, you know, but I think the question is fundamentally wrong headed. The question that ought to be asked is if there's a God, why hasn't he convinced me himself? Yes. Why is it up to uh, uh, why is it up to David or Matthew uh, or uh, and by the way, we have a David and a Matthew in my, in my extended family. Uh, but why is it up to the individual? And even even if it is, um, I think then I have to take the the David Hume a question seriously. So if God's not going to present himself to me, then Hume would say, if it's presented through another human, is it possible that, uh, and he would say this even about miracles from a God, but especially about another human, if someone presents you with evidence, and it's evidence for a supernatural being, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be more likely that you were deceived than that the laws of nature had been broken. I don't get it from from either perspective. Uh, would I, if you could convince me that there's a God? Well, if God wanted that job done, he'd have to do it. And if he wants somebody else to do that God uh, to do that job, as far as I can tell, any other human is as fallible as I am, and it is more likely that they are wrong than that the laws of nature were broken in the favor of convincing me that there was a God. I think you've just described deconversion, right? Like uh, sometimes uh, one definition of deconversion is the slow, imperceptible raising of your standard of evidence. And you've mm. just described a reasonable standard of evidence. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think the, the point is that, you know, before we deconverted our standard of evidence for this specific thing, we might have been skeptics in every other area, but for this specific thing was very low, right? The, if you yeah. are convinced by... And I'm not I'm not straw manning here. Uh, anonymous uh, oral traditions written down decades after the fact of extraordinary miracle <laughs> events. If that is sufficient evidence for you, uh, it's very hard to have that conversation, right? As a as a as an atheist, uh, you know, yeah. uh, talking about real standards of evidence. Mm -hmm. It is. Um... I know that there are. Uh, by the way, if you're if you're a uh, if you're a philosophy geek and you're listening and you're aware that there are attempted answers to Hume, I'm aware that they exist too. If you're not a, a philosophy geek, Hume is a great place to start. Uh, I don't think any of the answers in regard to Hume's questioning of miracles and human faculties are particularly successful. And this is not the right show to go into, and maybe we can at another point. I do know those answers are there. I just want to know why God is trying to convince me of his perfection through somebody who fundamentally, in my view, can't get it done if it's a person. So <laughs> there we are. Yeah. 
Matthew, what do you what do you have? Where are we? I'm I'm running dry. I've only got one more question. Are are you guys okay to say anything or? I've got I've through? got what I've got one more thing in in uh, kind of springboarding off of uh, Andrew's recommendation. I imagine you guys have read this already, but uh, I, a book that I can't recommend enough is Carl Sagan's A Candle in the Dark. Uh, mm. Why it's important is I went back I ta- earlier. I talked about, you know, the comparison to Santa Claus becomes very offensive. What's important about it is Sagan is describing his youthful attraction to aliens that, you know, he was all about aliens. That was his thing. He, he loved the, you know, the idea of it. And could it possibly be that aliens had visited Earth, right? Obviously, we know the rest of the story. Sagan becomes a world-renowned scientist. And the, the book is about, even though he wants to believe this thing desperately, that is important to him, his standard of evidence is so painfully high that he cannot come to the point to say that aliens exist. And a conversation that I've I've had a few times or something I've tried to convey is when we're talking to an apologist, the question is not why are our standards so high? We're not being mean by having these high standards. The question is, if it's true, why are your standards so low? Uh, right. Shouldn't yes. it have the excruciating yes. shouldn't it pass excruciating levels of scrutiny uh, if it's true? And it yeah. this is the bottom line for apologetics of. Why does apologetics exist at all, right? We should just, it either should be <laughs> uh, obviously true uh, or or there should be overwhelming amounts of evidence and neither of those things is the case. I think you've preempted what my final question was going to be, Dave, because you've gone a fair way to, to asking it. The, um, the question I was going to ask on this whole subject of why can't we or won't we worship the Christian God is what would we want to convey to Christians listening to try to explain our position? And I think you've pretty much hit your answer <laughs> with that. But yeah. if there's anything else that you want to add to that, otherwise I'll just pass on to Andrew. I'll just I'll just add one more reference. Uh, one of my favorite short stories is Ted Chang, Hell is the Absence of God. In the short story, he uh, imagines a real theistic God. It's very generic. It's not specifically Christian or anything. But this God interacts with the world and and there are scientists and statisticians that, you know, observe these phenomena and describe it in great detail. In other words, there's evidence for this God. And as you're reading this short story, it is just screaming at you (laughs) how our world, the world we live in, is not that world and that uh, we do not have that kind of evidence. And again, um, that's the kind of thing that I would be looking for to change my mind is a, a, an excruciatingly high level of, of standard of evidence for the existence of God, and which would be, we need to say, trivial for a truly all-powerful, all-knowing God. Andrew? We often say, uh, and, and people have heard me say in the back catalog, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I, I want to modify that very slightly. I don't think all extraordinary claims do require extraordinary evidence. If you're making an extraordinary claim that doesn't matter, then I don't have to care that you've made an extraordinary claim, right? So, so if you tell me that uh, pixies feed you breakfast, it's quite, an, it's quite an extraordinary claim. But if you're not asking me to do anything about it, fine. You can, you know, we, we don't have to have a conversation about pixies feeding you breakfast or whatever extraordinary claim you make. However, if you are making an extraordinary claim, and you expect me to make some life-altering decisions based on those claims, and, and here's one. Jesus is the salvation of humanity, and if you don't follow Jesus, you may lose your soul in eternal hellfire. It's quite an extraordinary claim. And you do, even if you only want me to make a change because you care for me, it is still a change that you're asking for. And you shouldn't be surprised. It shouldn't be surprising at all that I would want evidence that equals the claim. And and so I think that was always in the background of, of when we say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But but the reason we say it, and, and I think here it just has to be punctuated, 
is because your extraordinary claims, Christians, and uh, and anyone else that thinks my soul is in jeopardy if I don't worship your God, the reason that I expect extraordinary evidence and the reason that you should be able to deliver it, and if you can't, you should leave your religion too, is because no one should be able to alter the decisions that you would otherwise make through something that is nothing more than a threat. And it's only a threat if you can't provide the evidence. Speaking just for myself, I refuse to be threatened into religion. Yeah, that's a good point to end on, Andrew. Threatening isn't how you get us. We've already alluded to to that. If God really is a a God of love, then we will feel it and there'll be a way in which that can be conveyed to us. So if you're a Christian listening and you're wondering why I can't or won't worship a God, it's not arrogance as I saw on a Christian blog only today when I was just looking for things that Christians were saying about people like myself. It really isn't. And I don't boast about it either, even if that's how you may have heard my tone uh, in this episode. And I use the word can't because it's not possible for me because of all the things that I've said previously. You know, I'm unconvinced that the God exists. The God that I used to believe in and the God that I see in the Bible is a God I can't identify with in the context of loving behaviour, because it's behaviour that I as an individual see as destructive and hurtful uh, and harmful and comes under the banner of evil God rather than loving God. So when I see all of that and the package of Christianity that you're trying to sell me convinces me that God is not a God to be loved, It's not a God that I as an individual can love. And worse is a God that I see as a devil God. If that's the God that I am seeing from what you're trying to sell me, then you shouldn't be surprised when I say I can't love that God. And when I was deconstructing and I was begging this God for that feeling of love, for that exposure to something So that to stop me from deconstructing whatever it may be, either an experience of him or some kind of physical evidence that could be tested and confirmed or even just a straight out speaking to me in a dream. I can't remember the combinations of things that I asked for. If all of those fail to pan out, am I justified in rejecting? I think so. Yes. So what would bring me back? In a previous episode that Andrew and I had, we had uh, it's called questions with well, more questions with Christians, I think, where we have Caleb and Kevin, I think, asking us questions. And I talk a little bit about my my deconstruction experience there and how I felt utterly rejected by the God that I believed. If I felt so rejected by that God, what makes you think that you can sell me something that would make me feel loved by that God again? Don't I need to feel that love? from the God that I that I felt rejected from previously. So I want you to think that through and think through all of the complexity that's going on in the mind of the deconstructing, the mind of the person who feels that they can't love or worship a God because that God not only doesn't want them, but actively refused to act for them. So that is why we can't love that God, can't worship that God, can't accept that God. So please try and see it from from that, the perspective that we've gone here. And David, graceful as he is, has pushed back on Andrew and I and tried to steel man the position to try to drive this conversation along. But even then, in all his gloriousness, David has still failed to get me to (laughs) appreciate the context of that God that you're trying to sell me. So can you be better than David? Because I failed that's at what evangelism. He needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're laughing because we tease and because we love each other and we're we're all friends. But that is a serious challenge. Can you steal man your God better than David tried to do in this episode? Because that's the challenge. That is what you absolutely need to be able to do. And you need to be able to do it with so much intensity 
that I actually genuinely feel unrejected by your God. I don't know how you can do that. And I genuinely think that you'll struggle to do that. So under that banner, please and please appreciate that it's just not possible in that, and at this moment to worship the Christian God. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasurable past hour and a half. As a teaser, we have had a conversation about getting David back again. We're going to work something out about that. So hold on to your hats. There'll be a few episodes in between. It definitely won't be back to back episodes. As another little teaser, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be, Andrew and I are going to be speaking to somebody. So that will be done by the time you listen to this. So in a few weeks time, hopefully we'll have a fascinating conversation with a pastor who's written a book about answering skeptics questions. Maybe he will have that answer. I'll see if we can, we'll find out with that. Thank you, David. Have you got anything exciting coming up in your stream that you want to tease people on? Uh, you know, I've, I've, uh, I, I'm actually behind on interviews and things, so I don't have a lot to tease here other than Daniel from uh, the When Belief Dies podcast. So he's the yes. new co-host over there with yep. Sam. Uh, so Daniel will be coming up here shortly. Um, and the podcast is Graceful Atheist, and you can find that on all major platforms. Excellent. There's, there's one more teaser, Matthew. I think uh, I think our next show with Dave is going to be the less graceful atheist, where we get Dave to really come unglued. Okay, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys get the you guys get the the hard atheist out of me more than anyone else. I, <laughs> so. We may have to give you a pseudonym for next time you come yeah, on. That's exactly. <laughs> David, thank you for being with us. Guys, and then until next time, good night. You have been listening to a podcast from Reason Press. Do you have any thoughts on what you've just heard? Do you have a topic that you would like us to cover? Please send all feedback to reasonpress at gmail.com. You might even appear on an episode. Our theme music was written for us by Holly. To hear more of her music, see the links in our show notes.